It's the first week of January and for this channel that means space memes. We'll just ride out that post-Christmas lethargy together until we're much more productive by laughing at some space memes and hopefully also learning something in the process as well. This really is the educational Trojan horse of a meme reaction video. So I asked you all on Twitter and Instagram to send me your favourite space memes and then I had Sam go through them all and pick out the best ones so I could react to them. So let's just dive in headfirst with the first meme. <laughs> Launch pad under Artemis 1. This is fine. <laughs> I do love this. If you missed this, the SLS rocket that NASA has developed, you know, specifically to launch the Orion spacecraft, you know, it's capable of carrying humans to the moon. So it's much, much heavier than, you know, any rocket that's used to launch like a satellite or something. That's part of the planned Artemis missions. You know, it's the most powerful rocket that NASA has ever developed. But the launch pad wasn't quite ready for it, even after all of those postponements because of fuel leaks and because of Hurricane Ian. But it did, you know, finally launch Artemis 1 back in November 2022 from the ML1 launch pad at Kennedy Space Center. And it essentially scorched the thing. You know, it fried some cameras, it broke some pipes, it even blasted some of the lift doors off. You're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off. And it managed to do that just because of the sheer power involved in the launch of, you know, a craft that's rated to get humans to the moon. You know, it's much heavier than anything we normally launch, so you need a lot more power behind it. And the temperatures in the launch reach something like 3,000 Fahrenheit, which is what, like, 1,600-ish Celsius in normal units. And, you know, the engineers, like, knew that this was going to happen. They knew that the launch pad would take some damage. But when you think about it in terms of, like, a cost-benefit situation, it was much more cost-effective to actually just fix the damage that they knew was going to happen than, you know, build a whole new launch complex for the SLS, which at the minute is only planned to launch five times within the next decade. So in a way, the, this is fine. It sums up the situation perfectly, weirdly, because it is fine. That was what was expected. Anyway, moving on to the next one. Well, speaking of normal units, uh, zero pounds equals zero kilograms, zero inches is zero centimeters, but none of the temperature scales agree on what zero degrees is. In fact, Kelvin doesn't even use degrees as like the incremental unit. You don't say 5,000 degrees Kelvin, you just say 5,000 Kelvin, and it messes with my head every single time. <laughs> you know what I say, right? Space is hard, words are harder. Anyway, so here you've got the Fahrenheit scale, which is like zero to 100 degrees based on like what are comfortable temperatures that humans can survive in. And I use comfortable very loosely there. It's very cold outside right now. You've then got Kelvin with zero based on what is like absolute zero temperature, i.e. the molecules in a substance have zero energy. They're not moving about at all. They're not jostling about. Then you've got the Rankine scale, which I guess most people probably are not as familiar to, but it's just like the Kelvin scale with zero as the absolute temperature. But instead of like one degree Kelvin equal one degree Kelvin, see, I just did it there. One Kelvin equaling one degree Celsius, one degrees Rankine is one degrees Fahrenheit. So it's much more comparable to the Fahrenheit scale rather than Celsius. And then of course you've got Celsius there too, which, you know, like zero to a hundred is the freezing and boiling point of water. Then there's degrees RA here, which I haven't come across before. Like RA to me is right ascension, right? The equivalent of like longitude on earth, but in sky coordinates for where things are in the sky. Is RA even a temperature? Like, let's Google this. <laughs> no, it looks like RA is also ranking. Like, ranking can either be degrees R or degrees RA. I guess what I love about looking at this meme, right, is that Will Turner is played by Orlando Bloom, who's British and he's represented by Celsius, which is the temperature scale that we use here in Britain. Then you've got Jack Sparrow. Captain, Captain Jack Sparrow. Played by Johnny Depp, who's from the US, and the scale they use is Fahrenheit, and he's representing Fahrenheit. And then you've got Elizabeth Swan, played by Kira Knightley, representing Kelvin, K, K. Then you've got Barbosa, Played by Jeffrey Rush, 
Uh huh. Rush representing Ran Keen. Now I don't know if whoever made this meme thought it through in that much detail. It's much more likely that I'm just overthinking things because let's face it, that's what I do. But I really, really enjoy that level of detail. <laughs> anyway, let's let's look at the next one, shall we? <laughs> All right, these are JWST images of SMACS 0723, which was like the first science image released by NASA and ESA from JWST back in like July 2022. Oh, do you remember the endless whole music from that White House press conference when they released this image? Like, uh, like I'm triggered now, like just, just thinking about it, just like. That image was released. It did feel like this image was everywhere. Like it was on every news program. It was all over social media feeds. And I think that's what this meme is actually referring to. But I think what it really nicely encapsulates is how a lot of scientists feel right now when they finally get the JWST data that, you know, maybe they proposed for and applied for almost two years ago now and have probably been planning for for the past like 10, 20 years. Because, you know, the way that these telescopes work, you know, it's a space telescope. You you don't get to go like you get to go to some of the ground-based telescopes to use those in far-flung places. What you end up doing is you just sort of send these really detailed instructions for what you want to look at and how long for and with which instrument to the telescope operators at the Space Telescope Science Institute in, in Baltimore more in the US and it just gets scheduled among everybody else's observations and you just have to sit and wait until one day you check your emails and it's like hey date is ready go download it from the archive and then you just get inundated by data and you know it, it can feel a little bit overwhelming because you've been waiting so long for it and all of a sudden there's just reams and reams and reams of it there that you've now got to you know, do all the analysis for and figure out what it, it means. And yeah, it can be overwhelming, just like this meme is showing. But it is a very good problem to have, in fairness. Anyway, next one. <laughs> Dinosaurs watching the dark mission like. So I'm sure that you're familiar, but just a quick recap, right? The Alvarez hypothesis is that a mass extinction occurred around 65 million years ago due to the impact of a large asteroid. And it's thought to be the impact that created the Chicxulub crater at the top of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And it's thought that that impact disrupted the climate and the atmosphere, leading to the mass extinction of around about 75% of all life on Earth. The best evidence we have for that is the layer of iridium found in rocks all around the world, which was laid down around 65 million years ago. And there's something like more than a hundred times the amount of iridium in that one layer than you'd normally find in rocks on Earth. Like iridium as a metal is really, really rare on Earth, but it's really common in asteroids. So it's now pretty widely accepted that an asteroid of around about 10-ish kilometers is what led to this mass extinction of land-faring dinosaurs. And it's, you know, always been a worry for us humans that the same could happen to us as well. So ideally, we'd have a way to defend ourselves against any asteroids that might pose a threat in the future. And that is where NASA's DART mission comes in. So last year in September 2022, the DART spacecraft, it crashed into the asteroid moon Dimorphos to try and slow it down and, and change its orbit around the asteroid Didymus. Now, if we could do that, just nudge an asteroid slightly to change its speed, that effect is then cumulative. And then what you do is essentially change that collision course as the two objects, the asteroid and Earth, move in their orbit so the asteroid would just miss Earth instead. Now that test done back in September was incredibly successful. It exceeded all of our expectations. Now admittedly, Dimorphos is only 170 meters wide and not 
10 kilometers wide, but the data from that test is going to be analyzed to work out exactly how much energy was transferred in the impact of the DART spacecraft. Then we can say, okay, we're capable of transferring this much energy with one of these spacecraft impacts. If we did that to a 10 kilometer wide asteroid, then how much would that change its speed by? And then what would the cumulative effect be in order to change its course? And therefore, for it to miss Earth, how far in advance do we have to deflect it? If you want to know more about this, I'll link my previous videos on DART in the description down below. But essentially, unlike the dinosaurs, you can rest assured that there is a plan in place. Although, let's hope that we never have to use it. Anyway, God stars, this, this video was supposed to be cheerful and we've ended up in such like a dark and dreary place for a January. So I'm going to see which one's next so we can have a laugh again. Oh, we see it. Aliens in movies. That was brilliant timing. If anyone from Hollywood is watching this, please remember the next time you make another asteroid film that the entire rest of the world exists. It's from the Americans. It's about bloody time. What do they plan to do? All right, I think I've got one more. All right, it's the SMACS image again. What does that say? Never gonna give you. I have been rickrolled by a JWST image. <laughs> what has life come to? <laughs> like, do you think NASA ever envisioned this when they were planning for JWST like 30 years ago, right? Like, most distant galaxy, no, never found. Yes, like gravitational lenses to measure the masses of clusters and look how much dark matter is there. Yes, rickrolling. No, like I'm just, I'm, t I'm just too invested in JWST data to get rickrolled by it, right? Like NASA is apparently planning on releasing the TRAPPIST-1 data very soon, which is the seven planet system with like two or three planets in the habitable zone, which you know where life could possibly exist. And can you imagine if instead of biomarkers, like in the spectrum of the atmosphere of these exoplanets, like they just rickrolled us all. <laughs> They never would though, right? Because scientists have learned the hard way that those kind of jokes like do not go down well. Like we all remember Chewie So Gay, right? <laughs> well, it looks like that one was my last meme, but if you want more, you check out my previous meme videos. I'll link them in the video description down below for you. But it's time for me to get back to actually being productive. Now I have got an observing proposal that I want to write to try and get some time on Alma to observe some galaxies, but unfortunately it's not gonna write itself now, is it? <laughs> How annoying. Uh, uh. All right, let's do this. First video of the year, 2023. I'll let, let's have some lipstick. I don't, I don't know why the eagles are in my head. No, I, I do know why the eagles are in my head. They're like my January comfort music. Christ, I'll climb on a cross trainer in the sky. 